Welcome to the cardiovascular system, the vasculature part two. This tutorial will focus on capillaries and veins. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore and I'm the histology wizard. Capillaries are the real heart of the circulatory system, pun intended. This is of course the exchange of matter between tissues and blood. Although capillaries are by far the most numerous vessels, they hold only a small fraction of the blood at once. Capillaries are found in all tissues, but are more abundant in tissues that have high metabolic demands. There are three morphological types of capillaries, and we will now review each type, discussing the features that give each its unique function. The first type of capillary is the continuous capillary. These are the most common type and are found in muscle, brain, lungs, connective tissue, and nervous tissue. These capillaries are lined by a complete endothelium and a basal lamina, and the capillary endothelial cells are linked by tight junctions. They are also associated with specialized cells called parasites. These cells have some characteristics of smooth muscle and are in close contact with the basal lamina. We'll talk more about their function shortly. These capillaries are essentially closed systems, and thus they transport fluids and solutes in vesicles by penicytosis. Parasites or periendothelial cells play critical roles. They're seen here in a scanning electron micrograph and a transmission electron micrograph, and you can appreciate in both their close association with the capillaries. Once thought to be merely supportive, we now know that parasites have important and varied functions. For example, they're responsible for much of the integrity of the blood-brain barrier, and loss of parasites is known to compromise this barrier. Here's a cartoon showing how parasites normally cover capillary endothelial cells. They allow normal perfusion, but block insults or toxins that might damage neurons. If these cells are compromised or lost, this alters the blood-brain barrier and causes it to break down, resulting in damage to the neurons. Parasites serve in a similar capacity in the blood-retinal barrier. For instance, parasite loss is a severe pathological process in diabetic retinopathy, with detrimental consequences for eyesight in millions of patients. In addition, parasites possess a multipotent differentiation potential, which allows for generations of a number of different cell types. And because of this, these cells are potential targets for tissue repair and therapeutic approaches in regenerative medicine. The second type of capillary is the fenestrated capillary. These vessels have pores, or fenestrae, or windows, that may or may not have a diaphragm. In this image from the jejunum, the fenestrae actually have diaphragms. These openings facilitate regulated exchange of larger molecules. These capillaries are found in organs or tissues where molecular exchange is important, such as intestines, endocrine glands, and around kidney tubules. The kidney glomerulus has fenestrated capillaries that lack diaphragms. The third and final type of capillary is the discontinuous capillary, or the sinusoid. These vessels have an incomplete endothelial lining and incomplete basal lamina, and this allows for large gaps that promote even greater exchange. And you can see these gaps at the blue arrows in this electron micrograph. In this scanning electron micrograph, you can appreciate the very large size of these sinusoids. Discontinuous capillaries or sinusoids are found where there needs to be an intimate relationship between blood and parenchymal cells, for example, in the liver and the spleen. This diagram summarizes the main characteristics of each type of capillary. We won't go over it here, but it should be useful to you as a reference. Now I'd like to go back and discuss endothelial cells. The general assumption is that these cells were inert, that they were inert, simple squamous epithelium that just happened to line blood vessels, but this has been proven incorrect. As we talked about in the heart video, these cells have critical roles in the body. This diagram illustrates some of the important functions of endothelial cells and shows the dynamic nature of their responses. I'm not expecting you to know any details of this figure, but it illustrates the complexity of these cells. Let's consider a basic endothelial cell under physiological conditions, so normal blood pressure, good laminar flow, and the presence of proendothelial growth factors. It's now considered to be in a basal state. As a result, this cell is non-adhesive and prevents clotting, which is important for hemostasis. However, when conditions become suboptimal, such as with increased blood pressure, more turbulent blood flow, or perhaps the presence of bacteria or viruses or toxins, these cells now enter an activated state, and they turn on molecular pathways that increase adhesion 
and trigger inflammatory responses, etc. Here's another example of one function of vascular endothelial cells, regulation of vascular tone. This one I do want you to know. Endothelial cells produce vasoactive substances that induce contraction or relaxation of smooth muscle cells, and this causes vasoconstriction or vasodilation, respectively. Here's two examples. Endothelins cause vasoconstriction, while nitrous oxide causes smooth muscle cells to relax, causing vasodilation. Next, we will consider the venous system. Veins in general have relatively thin walls in comparison to arteries of similar size. This thinness contributes to the distensibility of vein walls, which contributes to their high capacitance. Veins are considered compliance vessels and can hold a large amount of blood relative to their volume. Similar to arteries, veins contain three tunics or layers, the tunica intima, media, and adventitia. The distinction or boundary between tunica intima and media is not clear in veins, since they lack a distinct internal elastic lamina. Further, the tunica media is thinner, and it lacks the regular orientation of smooth muscle fibers seen in arteries. The tunica adventitia consists of connective tissue and often contains vasa visorum. A typical structure found in veins but not in arteries is the valve. These valves are actually projections of the tunica intima that project into the lumen. They're covered in endothelial cells and are reinforced by elastic and collagen fibers. Since the blood in veins is under low pressure, these valves prevent the blood from moving backward. In other words, they ensure one-way flow. Unlike arteries, veins don't move blood via contraction of smooth muscle in their tunica media. Instead, their transport depends upon extrinsic forces, such as contraction of skeletal muscle surrounding the vein and the integrity of the valves. Like arteries, veins can become dilated, but these are called varices instead of dilations, as in arteries. Typical varices include hemorrhoids, varicose veins, and varices of the esophagus, and we'll see some examples of these later in the unit. The venous system starts at the end of the capillary bed with the post-capillary venule. This venule resembles a continuous capillary, although its lumen is wider. They are the preferred site of diapodeus, the migration of immune cells into tissues. These venules merge into muscular venules that have increased layers of smooth muscle. The image on the right, shown here, compares a muscular venule to an arterial, and you can see that while both contain smooth muscle layers, the venule, marked by the star, has a more irregular shape. Now here's an example of a medium-sized vein, and you can see the presence of the semilunar valves in the image on the right. Here's a question for you. Think about it for a few minutes. This micrograph contrasts a medium artery with a large vein and illustrates the important similarities and differences between these two vessels. Note the differences in the tunics and the presence of valves in the veins and the presence of the internal elastic lamina and the many layers of smooth muscle in the artery. Next, pause the video and take a few minutes to test yourself on this image. See whether you can identify each vessel and note the characteristics of each, including the properties of the different tunics. Finally, we will briefly talk about lymphatic vessels. The normal function of the lymphatics is to return proteins, lipids, and water from the interstitium to the intravascular space and about 40 to 50 percent of serum proteins are transported by this route every day. High hydrostatic pressures in arterial capillaries force proteinaceous fluid into the interstitium, resulting in increased oncotic pressure that draws in additional water. Although 90 percent of interstitial fluid returns to the circulation via entry into venous capillaries, the remaining 10 percent is returned by the lymphatic system. A second important role is to conduct immune cells and lymph to lymph nodes. These vessels are under low pressure and the flow in lymphatics is unidirectional. The structure of lymphatic capillaries consists of a single layer of endothelial cells with anchoring filaments to prevent the capillaries from collapsing. These lymphatic capillaries converge into larger lymphatic vessels and then into collecting vessels, and these vessels are surrounded by smooth muscle. Lymph flows due to both intrinsic contraction of smooth muscle in the lymphatic walls, as well as contractions of surrounding muscles or compression of tissues from outside the body. These larger vessels have three tunics, similar to small veins, but the lumen is larger and more irregular. Also like veins, the lymphatic vessels have valves, but they're usually greater in number than in veins. Here's a micrograph showing an artery and a lymphatic vessel. Compared to the artery, the lymphatic vessel has thinner tunics, and it lacks red blood cells in the lumen. Now there are lymphatic vascular disorders, most of which are a result of defective development of the lymphatic vessels or damage to these vessels. One common disorder is lymphedema. Edema, 
where the volume of interstitial fluid increases and exceeds the drainage capacity of lymphatics can occur for many reasons, but often occurs as a result of heart failure. Subcutaneous edema is caused by an increase in hydrostatic pressure in the venous system due to right-sided heart failure, while pulmonary edema occurs with left-sided heart failure. This wraps up our discussion of the vasculature. For more information on pathologies, check out Cardiovascular Pathologies. Thanks for stopping by.